So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the AMRC's webinar on Untangling the Digital Twin. I hope you find it informative and uh, learn something by the end of this. Um, so just before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, can you please uh, place them in the chat? We'll try and answer them as we go as well to make the session a little bit more interactive. But uh, just to, uh, to kick it off, please can you just answer this, uh, this quick poll that we've put in place? So as you can see, what we're asking you is, is what, you know, what is it that you want to be able to take away from today? <clears throat> Obviously, you've come here to hear more about the report, but is there anything else in general that you actually would actually like to, uh, to understand about uh, digital twins? Where can they be? You know, what is the value of a digital twin to your business? Is your business ready to, uh, to, uh, to embrace the, 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 sort of the, the, the insight that can be created from a digital twin as well? We've got a couple of seconds left for everybody to uh, pick their options there. Looking good so far. So 68% so far understand the requirements of a digital twin. Well, that's interesting because that is uh, there's a lot of that in the report as well that John's going to be taking you through as well. And now 63 now to hear what the AMRC is doing with digital twins. It's interesting as well. Uh, not so much not so much to hear about the report itself, but it is out there. So maybe you've actually already read it before you've actually attended today. That's always a bonus, isn't it? And uh, and I think we've already got there. 50, oh, 49 percent now. Your figures are changing. How do you actually approach the adoption of a digital twin? And uh, I'm sure a lot of these will get answered as we as we go through the uh, as we go through the hour. So Gual is how how long have we got left now? Yeah, we can start now if you want. Okay then. So there's the end of the poll. Thank you very much. So, what is this event about, and why? And why have we done this report? So, there's, there's there's finally a majority consensus out there on what a digital twin is, but we wanted to get into the nitty gritty of of what's not a digital twin to draw the line through what we have defined as, as what we see as the key requirements for a digital twin. So, the high value manufacturing catapult (HVMC) AMRC is is part of that, as you as you may well know, has now recognised that this report that we put together as the standard definition of a digital twin. So the report delves into the detail of what you require to design, develop, and implement a digital twin. So therefore, answering some of these questions that we uh, that we put up in our first poll. So even uh, the, the BSI, the British Standards, have started to, to draft a framework as well around these requirements to support the creation of digital twins under a series of which is uh, which is numbered as ISO 23247. So. You all, I hope, managed to select a question on the sessions that we've ha had open from the start, and uh, we'll try and answer those points at the end. Um, if not, please uh, get in touch with uh, the AMRC for uh, for a one-to-one -one discussion uh, if you want, and if you want to find out more. So, from the initial poll, we could see that you were very interested in uh, in, in in the requirements and the adoption of that. But just before we go further, we want to just just ask one more very quick poll, um, just to sort of set the context for the for the rest of the discussions. And Gual, can you put that one up now? Which is, what do you think there is? A, do you think that there is a need to actually have a physical asset for having a digital twin? So this is this is something a lot of people actually are not quite sure about if it's if it's a requirement or not. And as we're saying, you know, more, more importantly to understand, you know, the difference between a digital twin and and what is not a digital twin. So the definition, I've got to say, of a digital twin, defined by the AMRC and adopted by the HBMRC, is that we've all started putting up there. You said everyone said 63% has said yes, so that's right. So the definition as put up for the AMRC is it, a digital twin must have a physical asset and importantly a connected physical asset. So a recent report by the AIAA goes so far as to say no connected physical asset equals no digital twin. So it's great to see that uh, the American authorities as well around this are, um, are aligned with us too. So to explain more about the requirements of a digital twin and why we at the AMRC and HVMC see this report as an essential position piece to enable the adoption of digital technologies into advanced manufacturing and beyond, I'll hand over to Jonathan here, the AMRC's technical lead for digital twin and advanced visualization, who's working within the advanced uh, manufacturing group, or if you know the AMRC, the IMG. So John, over to you. And uh, I hope uh, everybody really gets something out of the rest of the session. Yeah, cheers, John. And thank you for everybody for answering those quick polls as we came into this session. So 
really this sort of slide pack I've put together for this webinar, I, I've done it in such a way that I can tailor it towards that aspect. It's pretty much what I expected, but I, I will want to get out uh, the most value for you during the session. I think I'm just on that last poll as well of, yes, to have a full digital twin, you do need a physical asset, which we'll jump into, but really is you don't need to start looking towards the adoption of your digital twin by having something physical exist. It's just you only have it when you actually have it there, which of course we'll, we'll jump into now. So John said, I'm Jonathan Eyre, I'm technical lead in digital twins for AMRC, and it was sort of my report and the principal editor of that report put together. So if you have any questions, by all means, reach out with my contact details at the end. So just to jump into it then, a lot of the time digital twins said, oh, it's new, and it needs to be proven, and we want to understand what it means for us. But actually, the new part for us is just the digital aspect, is we can do it better with Industry 4 and a lot of the technology coming through. Um, one of the key examples of this with um, sort of the um, sort of recent centenary of the, of the event was the D-Day landings um, so Southwick Hall. Um, we modeled the Allied invasion um, with little boats on, on a map with the real world location of that being fed back um, by radio. So it wasn't a connected digital twin, but we always want to have these virtual mock-ups of understanding what is happening live with information that is happening elsewhere. Now, Fortunately, um, we no longer have to be NASA to do this. Um, so these had um, the way of communicating with the spacecraft, understanding exactly what was happening um, back on Earth as the um, space shuttle was doing what it was doing. But now, because of the cost of, or decreased cost of computation, advancements in sensor technology, cloud infrastructure, it become a lot cheaper. So now we can have digital twins even at the consumer level for sort of home automation kits, Telling your boiler to fire up when you're just going back from a walk, like a lot of this connected technology is all around sort of digital twin concept. And I think Garner has sort of come out quite a few years ago now and said expecting large organizations will gain at least 10% improvements in effectiveness. I think that's fairly minimal. I think with, with some of the other statistics that have come out more recently, um, there's a lot more um, advantage and a lot more improvements that can be made with it within certain areas. But I think as a blanket rule, 10% is sort of a minimum for a lot of the um, things that you could look to gain by having sort of this live connected data through to physical assets. So how do we define a digital twin then? So AMRC, and as John mentioned now, the adopted HVMC definition of a digital twin is that we have a live digital coupling of the state of a physical asset or process to a virtual representation with a functional output. Now, it's quite a lot of words, um, and that's because those six parts involved um, are the requirements of a digital twin, and this is how we want to break it out. So the next few slides are gonna go sort of a little bit into the details, and as the poll said, you want to understand the requirements, and that's quite what all this section's about, really, is understanding those requirements. But first of all, as I said, digital twins aren't new, and actually the biggest digital twin is the weather, and it's something that we use daily. Um, we have, the physical system out there in the world of, of what's happening with weather um, in Sheffield for once it's glorious sunshine um I hope it's sunny where you are in the world but we can model that and we can visualize that on a mobile phone application it could be another part of just a google maps on on the web browser on, on your desktop we can dashboard and visualize this information in that state we capture with sort of temperatures, little icons for whether it's partly cloudy, sunny, rainy, snow next week apparently. And it is mapping this, what's physically happening out in the world versus how do we want to represent it. And as it changes, this sort of virtual representation changes as well. So the technology exists, we're already doing it, it's just we might not necessarily call it a digital twin all of the time. So just jumping into the requirements then, so starting off then with live, it's this is probably one of the most contentious parts around a digital twin. And this is why we've ultimately defined it as live, is that as long as you have state information available in a time frame that is close enough to the underlying event, then it's considered live. It's the same premise around having football scores. So when you are looking at, do you need to watch a whole match every single second or sort of 30 hertz coming through a TV screen, or do you just need to care about having an update whenever somebody scores? And, and that's it, is if you're getting the information that you need, just as you need it, then it's live. You don't have to have a constant real-time stream of the information coming through. 
So digital coupling then. So this is the sort of the difference between the first example and the second example I gave you of the transmission mechanism has to be digital. Um, this could be sort of a web request, it could be a sort of a, a polling OPC UA structure or something of that type. But as long as we're automatically gathering data and transmitting it, then you have a digital coupling. And state. So it's the way that you want to describe the unique physical asset or process at a specific time. So as long as you can describe it with XML, JSON, as, as you'll see a few examples in a second, if you've got a way of making a computer understand this information, then you can describe the state. So the fourth requirement then is to have something physical existing, so the asset or process, and again, this is coming back through some research that we did back in sort of 2018 now, and it's what AMRC has been actually saying in the space for a long time, is, is that you must have something physical that you're wanting to have a digital twin of. Um, otherwise, to be honest, it, it just comes down to what's the difference between that and just a simulation. Um, but what we're saying about these physical assets is that there must be something tangible to have value. So economic value, social value, or commercial value. And then moving on to the, the flip side, if you like, of, of the virtual representation is it, it's a way of understanding what's happening in the physical asset or process. So you need a way of understanding the description and the state information coming through to its logical model of, of that physical asset or process. And functional output. So this is the last piece. Um, and what we want to make sure here is that, yes, you have something physical. Yes, you have something virtual. And you're, you're bridging the gap with the state information, it's live. But we want to make sure that's actually been something done with it. So we're saying, look, if you can transmit it to a, another system, i.e. another digital twin, um, and having sort of a, a you know, structured approach around it, or a human observer, so dashboard or whatever else, then you have a digital twin in place. So this is, again, from the same report that we did of around 74% of engineers said that actually these representations, these kind of early adoptions of digital twins, will actually be just a core requirement to represent what is happening for dashboards. Um, and they actually see it re replacing a lot of that infrastructure that's currently in place now. So for those of you who like a schematic and have it laid out, um, this is how we're sort of mapping it out as a, uh, as a summary, really. We, ha we have the physical asset or process that we can describe with states. We live and we digitally couple that information through to the virtual representation. And then we can also bridge that out to be a functional output. So you have those dashboards available. The key piece here actually is that it's one directional. So we're saying for the core requirement of a digital twin, that we just have read only information from the physical asset into the virtual representation. Now you'll see shortly how we bridge this and expand it in the future, um, but it's, it's a key requirement of what we've captured of. Sometimes you can only access read only information um, normally, when you're working with supply chains and other customers' data, they might only want you to have read-only information, but we'd still classify it as a digital twin. So just jumping into the details a little bit now then, um, just kind of answering what you said on the poll of understanding a little bit more around these requirements and where we draw the line. Is this kind of idea of state information being available close enough to the underlying event? is there's, there's three examples on screen. So your classic machine tool needing a certain frequency of information, there's glacial speed, but if you started to capture that at 10, 100 hertz, you'd be wasting a lot of sort of information and database. And there's a door being opened. And what we're saying here is that actually, you can monitor them at all at different rates and at different sequences. So a machine process, you can still monitor at 10 hertz, but a glacial speed, you can monitor once a week. And then whenever you went during that week to gather the information, regardless of when you next look at it, within your saying and the definition here is that if I captured it once a week, it's good enough for my understanding of how the glacier is moving. As well as under the door, you don't need to poll it every sort of minute, half minute to say, is the door open or closed? You could just have the system in place, which a lot of more sort of new implementations of systems are doing is, hey, I don't care polling it, just let me know when it's changed. So as long as the infrastructure is in place for the door to say, let me know when you open and let me know when you close and you can trigger those events, that is still considered live. So just a bit of a question around 
well, okay, we have something physical here, we have a part, and we have what we've done here is a CMOM process of understanding the MBD information. So we have something physical, we have something um, virtual, we've modeled it, we've got the GD and T information here, um, sort of captured in that MBD information, and we've got the actual measurements of the part screen back onto it. But actually here, we're saying no, because it's a one-time snapshot, and it's uh, I've just done it, and you've got no intention to keep it up to date all of the time, then it's not a digital twin. So this is where we're saying we're drawing the line that it needs to be connected and have intention of being updated, not just a one-off snapshot. This is where often within the sort of digital twin space and, and other areas is you'll often come across the term digital passport and digital thread. And that's where there's still some division on, on where exactly we draw that line. But for MRC and what's now the, the HVMC understanding is, Digital passport and thread are enabled by digital twins, but unless it's live, it, it's not valid. So digital coupling, um, as I mentioned before, there's, there's a wide range of things here from sort of machine tools and shop floor connectivity through to sort of IoT smart home devices. And we're saying as long as it's digitally connected, so it could be a database, it could be OPC UA, which is common within manufacturing shop floor systems, MQTT or a Wi-Fi protocol, is as long as it's connected and it's doing it automatically, then we, we meet that requirement. Moving on to state then. So state is broken down into two parts. Um, so we'll go over the examples here and we've got uh, the format on the next slide. So when we're looking at examples, there's quite a lot of things that you could capture the state of. So for a robotic arm, that could be what end effect have you currently got attached? What's your joint positions currently? What's the safety loop around the cell? Is that being triggered or not? So really we're looking at how do you want to describe these things? Shop floor processes, it's what machines are running, what processes are running on the shop floor currently, how many staff members are on the shop floor today, what, how could we optimise and look towards doing it if we have that state information being able to be described. And supply chain is who's our current vendors, where's our current sort of um, logistics traffic over the world currently, where's the parcels coming through, what's all the real-time information coming through from that. So I mentioned them format. So this could, to some of you, just look like a load of text on the screen. And to be honest, it is. It's how do we want to describe all of the things that I want to be able to describe? And there's no common way to do this. And different applications will suit different text files, essentially. Um, but these are just three examples. Is we've got tag tables. For, um, for those of you sort of familiar with PLC programming, it's a dictionary in other terms of key value pairs of what you're trying to describe. What's the value of it? We've got JavaScript uh, object notation, commonly referred to as JSON, and which is a, a newer format, which is, is quite common within sort of the um, enterprise business layers now, as well as CSV. Um, and we'll get onto CSV just on the next slide, but having a file structure in place where you know what columns are which um, and what, what you're looking for is, is still a valid state format. So again, a little bit of an edge case here of if you just had numbers in a file, then is that state? And within our definition, we're saying no, because the challenge here is what do these numbers mean? It's okay describing numbers, but you need to understand what does that map to? So then if I add the context of this was actually displacement uh, in time series data in centimeters, um, actually then yes, you've got the context of if this was coming through live, these series of numbers, you can understand what that means and you've got the mapping to go, this is what it means on the physical asset. We now know how to map that to the virtual representation. So yes, as long as you've got the context. So moving on to the asset or process then. So we're looking at if it has economic, social or commercial value. So classic example of wind turbines, but a restaurant, if any of you remember what those were like, um, is looking at restaurants and kind of the commercial value to the owner, but also the social value to us as patrons, as well as the growing processes. Virtual representations then. So this is how you want to describe it as a system. And, and the common, um, I guess, fault here that a lot of people jump to is, oh, I've got a CAD model, or oh, I've got MBD information. I understand what is going around. Um, but actually it's any, computer format that you'd like to describe your um, physical asset around. So it could be at the bottom right, a value stream map. 
it's just a basic way of capturing what should this process be doing over time? Where are we in that current process? How do you want to describe it? It could be electrical, electrical uh, schematic here of what should the circuitry be doing? Is, is there faults in there? Kind of how do we want to understand and, and describe that information? Or it could be a, a simulation and saying, look, we do have the CAD and we want to look at how it, it could dry out or cool down after a process has been done. And functional output, just to kind of wrap up the requirements on this section, is actually uh, however you want to visualize it. It could be other digital twins, as, as I've mentioned already, but it could just be a dashboard, um, which is a lot of the current IoT deployments is we've got sensor data now, we just want to visualize it, want to see what that information is doing around. So dashboards could be immersive environments as well, pulling in the CAD information from a PLM system, augmenting it with IoT data, looking around and seeing exactly what's happening in the real world in these inversive environments, which is actually some of the work AMRC has done in this space. As well as just a slight tangent to the dashboard is actually having a graph, if it was live and up to date and you're able to say, well, what's the um, estimated time until failure is actually we can, we can deliver that as a functional output as well. So a car dashboard, just as an uh, example really of, yes, um, a car dashboard is that functional output of you can see exactly what your car is doing. Um, I wouldn't want this car because of the amount of errors, but the idea is whatever errors are there, you can see and understand without going and physically checking the sensors or the engine yourself and, and seeing what the, what the faults are or what you're currently doing. So actually, again, this technology is embedded in what we do as consumers, just within the manufacturing space, we put a terminology around it and it's now this understanding which is coming out around it. So in summary then, for those of you that turned up just to understand the requirements and, and kind of that part of it, um, this is where we've got to then really, it's we have these six requirements from a, a, an AMRC and as John said, the HVMC standpoint of each of these requirements we are working um, towards with, with a lot of deployments and for those asking around what's AMRC doing in this space, the answer is yes, um, we are working in a lot of this space um, looking at how we could enable the adoption or some companies come to and said, look, we're really good at simulation, but we're not really good at describing our physical assets and mapping it through. So that's where we're working with them on, or we're doing other aspects um, with, within other sections, depending on their criteria. So just looking at the sort of last two categorizations then. So we've got the requirements and that's great. But what we've found a lot more use when working with clients, um, don't myself within the aerospace and defense sector, is by breaking it down to these parts, it can actually enable a lot of stakeholder engagement within the business. So by describing things as assets, process, or enterprise, you can actually start to get the right stakeholders within the business. So asset being something that exists and that you're shipping around. Um, Siemens Motors, for example, you, you can gather live information out of them and it's the asset itself, um, aircraft traveling around, it's, you understand exactly what that asset is doing and, and transmitting it around. And then some of the more, um, so once you've got the asset and you've got the understanding around it, working then towards more processed digital twins, which are some of the AMRC examples I've got within this slide pack. Um, and looking at how well, yes, you've got assets, but you've also got other information sources. So pulling in sort of ERP information or MES information to understand what that process should be doing, what is it doing now, how can we build prediction tools around that. And obviously when you get to the enterprise level, it's okay, we've got all of our assets, we've got all of our processes, how do we make strategic decisions to do things better? So um, just the, the last categorization that we've done um, is to split it into three main sections on terms of what does it do? So the first one, which is what Gartner was saying, a lot of the IoT deployments will be is a supervisory. And it's that on the bottom diagram around how do we sort of visualize IoT data? How do we dashboard it? How do we just look at what the information is telling us? That's the supervisory digital twin. And then what we're seeing with deployments moving forward is that they either go down one of two routes. They either build in simulation models and look at how we can predict more complex state information so sort of time until sort of failure for predictive maintenance rather than reactive maintenance, those sorts of things. Or within more sort of traditional control systems, it's interactive. So yes, we can monitor something, but we also want to be able to say, well, actually, can you do this instead? Or could you change the um, part over? Or 
looking at how we can actually control the systems from this virtual representation as well without being right next to the system. So just as a summary of the requirements, I'll let the chat catch up and just if you've got any questions around the requirements then feel free. But we'll just jump into one last poll and uh, just understand, I guess, where your thoughts are currently with digital twin space. So what we've got here then is just to understand, yes, these are the requirements and this is what a lot of consensus is now driving around, um, say with AMRC working with the space we live in, or sort of the CDBB and Tech UK and other aspects, is that actually we've got to the point of the requirements, but what do you want to see next? Um, and, and what's your biggest challenges? So I'll just give it a few seconds for uh, time to come through. So I'll, I'll give it a few more seconds for, for uh, polls to come through. But interestingly enough, 70% are saying val uh, verification and validation of the virtual representation, um, which is a key part. I, I've, I actually agree on that one. Um, the others are key, but actually more and more we are getting questions and just inquiries around if we're using AI for the simulation models and, and the predictive aspects of it, how do we trust what is currently a black box solution of we've got no way to verify that. If we put this into production, it would always do what we wanted. Um, so yeah, that, that's certainly a key aspect. We can uh, probably close it off, there we go. Um, so other ones then is trust and security. Um, yeah, I think that's especially important as well. Um, we are looking at there, with, especially within supply chains, AMRC is doing some work around this, around actually the people that start to implement digital twins um, will provide their data onto a platform, and no doubt cloud for a lot of, um, a lot of you on the call. But actually, the people who will extract value out of your digital twin aren't yourselves. So it'll be your clients or whatever else. And actually having that trust and security in place um, as well is, is a key part. And within AMRC as well, we do have a, a dedicated cyber security team as well, looking at a lot of this work to validate sort of um, the threat vectors and whatever else to understand what, a lot, how a lot of this stuff, stuff coming through. So then 45% on standards, um, definitely a big drive. Infrastructure and connectivity, 41%. Um, yeah, another key part of it and how we do it. And then, yeah, the skill set, 30%. Um, I think it's an area that's coming up more and more and being asked of what should we look for in either graduates to train them up to understand our business, but be ready to take on the digital twin space or do a lot of this digital manufacturing work or whatever else. Um, for those 30% that did do that, there is an interesting report just out by the CDB looking at the skills and, and understanding of where to go. Um, so they've started to understand what you need to be for a cybersecurity engineer or whatever else. So might be of interest to you on, on that one. But well, certainly the other four are, are key areas that the AMRC are working with them. So moving on to case studies then. So um, how they're being used now. So I, I couldn't really do a digital twin presentation without saying wind turbines and jet engines. Um, they are being done a, a lot of the um, been done a lot really I guess is the way of saying that and what the results are that we are getting is that um, prescriptive maintenance um, is actually reducing reactive maintenance by around 40 percent and then the other part is that digital twins because you need the physical asset there's still a lot of discussion around well you could have a digital twin to allow you to do next generation design and it's actually not the point that needs to be raised here is that the, the real thing here is if you've got a digital twin of a current generation of an asset then you can use that to understand how is your product being used so actually next time when you come to design it and you put a certain factor of safety on the amount of stress it will be exerted with then we could also understand well okay what if we reduce that next time that would reduce the weight by so much which would increase sort of our profit on sort of the next design so actually it can influence next generation design but you actually, when you're gathering a lot of this sort of traditional IoT information or connected information about how assets are being used, then it's actually not directly sort of helping you support the next generation design. I hope that makes sense. And another one then, um, there's a, there's a um, system in place um, by Thoughtwire um, called Early Warning. And what that does is it actually monitors a lot of the um, data gathered in hospitals and sort of publishes that to dashboards and whatever else. So a lot, a lot of it is around supervised digital twins. What they found is by just tracking 
doctors' locations, nurses' locations, patient health, they've actually decreased, well, they've increased patient flow and decreased operational costs, but more importantly, they've decreased code blue events by 61%. Um, actually, code blue events, for those who aren't familiar, is when people are going into cardiac arrest. Um, so actually, by monitoring the patients better, you can stop and prevent a lot of the uh, issues that are arising within their health before it gets to that point. And just by understanding where doctors and nurses are around the hospital, then that's this sort of massive, in, uh, massive increase in sort of performance, if you like, uh, for them as a business. But yeah, it just goes to show the, the sort of the um, value, really, I guess, at the end of the day, um, of around these are the types of systems that we could have in place for manufacturing just to stop a lot of this reactive work going on. So some more sort of figures I was mentioning earlier, that 10% is quite conservative for a lot of things. 50% um, is estimated for reduction in unplanned uh, downtime. Um, the German automotive, I'll not name names, um, but said uh, every minute they aren't producing something, it costs them 40,000 euros, which is a phenomenal amount. Um, an example from PTC here, saying that actually they was working with a forging line um, and the reactiveness of the um, clutch um, for was actually sort of costing them a lot of money. What could they do? Again, sensed it up, looked at the supervisory, built a prediction model around it for the predictive digital twin, and actually enabled a 40% reduction in maintenance costs, um, saving them $200,000 uh, a year. And some smaller numbers, but quite um, significant for larger OEMs, 1% to 3% of capital equipment cost reduction, as well as 5% to 10% reduction in energy costs. Um, just by, to be honest, a lot of these are from monitoring and looking at small predictives to say, what's the trends, what are we looking for? So here's an example of work that we did um, a couple of years ago now with Rolls-Royce um, under the um, SMR, which is a, been re-announced re to the consortium. Um, and we were here integrating with a Siemens control system, looking at how we could monitor assets. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the SMR um, sort of understanding is we're looking at building small modular reactors, um, each unique to power the size of the city rather than a large infrastructure needed to power sort of half the country. Um, so what we've got here is by proving out the concept of, yes, we can integrate with the Siemens control system over an, sort of an information bus, we can start to understand what the system is doing as a whole. And that's what we've got here. Because of the uniqueness of a lot of the modules, we then pulled it into VR. A lot of the work we did was proving out the architecture. So industry four sort of reference diagrams and architectures that say this could be in VR, but this could be on a dashboard or anything else you need, really. So another example from AMRC, um, another common theme within industry four is that we are producing products faster and more unique than ever before. So a lot of clients are coming to us to work on reconfigurable fixturing. So this was done under the VUES program, again, a little while ago now, um, but it's still a good case study of these pogo um, sticks in the middle. Um, so if my mouse is coming through in the, in the middle there is the height adjustment for the um, connection of holding a uh, wing skin in place, or the leading edge of a wing skin, I should say. And also on the right hand side, there is a rotary table with 10 additional mounting points for holding the um, rib sections and the profiles in place. And the robot here actually does both the positioning of the pogo sticks to save cost, as well as the drilling as well. So it can change its end effect and, and start a drilling operation. So what we've done is though, we've proved the out before we can look, we can visualize state information. That's not really anything new. It's, it's more about the architecture and as, as you've all identified really, the, sort of trust and the standards around how we should do it more commercially. So we wanted to, within this project, look at how we can build prediction in digital twins. So comparing the physical to the virtual for decisions to be actionable. So simulations are great when you have a simulation specialist and they can produce them, but they aren't the key decision makers. Um, and they aren't the people that actually understand the problem to go, well, what if we try this? Or what if we do this or this one? So those what if scenarios, Yes, need to be produced by simulation experts, but need to be enabled with other people who don't understand simulations, but know what questions to ask. That's what we're looking at here. So on the left hand side of this, once it starts coming through, is that robotic cell I was discussing before. And you'll see here the uh, current end effect of the robot is actually to move the pogos around. 
So you'll see on the bottom left, um, we attach the GoPro to the actual robot arm head to move the pogo around um, to gather the process and to simulate what would happen, or in this case, actually do it as well. Um, we could move this ready to prepare for a wing sim coming in, as well as then sort of adjust it ready. Then on the right hand side, we've got the, uh, in this case, a Unity application reading all of the state information we are publishing over the uh, architecture we put in place for this demonstration to see it. So we don't need to be physically next to the cell, we've got this virtual representation. This was driven by URDF models, which is a standard approach for modeling a robot, as well as understanding of the kinematics of the robot. So how fast can each joint accelerate, decelerate, sort of what's its maximum velocity to, to map those sort of this physical asset through to its sort of virtual representation. And then in the side of the middle of the screen, we have what's known as a discrete event simulation. So in this, it's a fairly linear example of we know exactly what steps it needs to go to. But what that allows us to do is a prediction of completion time. Now, in this example, the completion time is a one-off thing. It's we're understanding this process, which could be sort of um, seven minutes late or whatever else. But the real value of what we're getting within this is the understanding around, well, yes, this is six minutes late, but what does that do to the factory? So by publishing that back out over the connectivity layer, is we want to understand, well, what does that do for storage? What does that do for the next production cell? What if it needed a heat treatment beforehand? So should we delay the start of that to save energy? And look at the bigger pictures around, yes, we have prediction tools, but what can we move on to do? So another one from Bam Nuttall. Um, so they were working with a company called Iotics, which is similar to the one in the report, for those of you who've read the report, um, but a slightly different take on it. So what Bam Nuttall do within the construction sector is that the, the people are on site manufacturing and building infrastructure. Um, and within the small margins that they have within the construction sector, they're really keen on improving today, but also having a architecture in place that they could improve it for future projects. And actually what they do is, is quite complex and they have a lot of information from a lot of different sources and they have to bring all this together and make the best decision possible for how they should operate. And there's a lot of data um, not to underestimate things and being affected by the weather um, and all of these different things of when deliveries are being late or being scheduled or can we operate the crane because how, how's the wind doing today is they need all of this information at their fingertips. So what they've done actually now is set up twins around construction sites um, to look at how they could supervise information. And, and the real key for why I like this little, little piece is the quote that they gave was, many supply, suppliers offer them an app to monitor their bit of kit, but actually it's no good to them. Um, they end up with 20 or 30 or hundreds of different applications to monitor bespoke pieces of kit. But really they almost want just an SDK of saying, we want to integrate it, with it. we'll pull it to our own dashboard, what can we do with it? So Fraser Nash, um, another good example, um, is they were sort of tasked with understanding how can we maintain a large fleet of turbines much better. The sort of cost of overhaul was is it is expensive and they wanted to know, or their client wanted to know, what could we do better? So for those of you not familiar with sort of the aerospace sector is a lot of turbine blade life is based upon safe operating hours. Um, is you don't run it further than what you think it can produce and what it thinks it will be able to sustain. And also as well, you don't have data about the blade itself. You have data around it. So you have inlet temperature and you have outlet temperature and you know the rotational speed of the engine, but you don't know exactly what this blade at this part of the engine is, and especially where the hot gases after the combustion process has happened in the middle. So within this example, they've actually done a lot more around the mathematical modeling, um, as you'd see. So they've created, tested, validated a lot of this complex physics with measuring and quantifying a lot of this stuff. So they've got these measured quantities to reduce all the models, be able to run it in real time to the blade, as well as then be able to predict blade damage line. Which overall for them, they found it's reduced failure because they actually better understand blade life now as well as both they've um, costing a lot less now for waste because they're running blades for longer than they were before, as well as leaner inventory management because they've started to build prediction models around, well, if this does this flight, actually then the blade will still be okay. And what they found is with their client is they're getting return on investment within two years. 
So even when spending sort of the three to four years they have building a lot of this complex mathematical modeling of and prediction tools, is they're still able to get return on investment within two years. And actually, the cost of the then rollout across the fleet is return on investment of five times that amount within five years. So for those of you who always ask around, well, how do we quantify? The, there are now starting to become examples and information out there. This is what it actually means for us. So just briefly then, just, as, just to round off really this session, is we had a physical cell before, and we could describe that with joint angles, end effector status, and a lot of this information. And for the sake of argument, we can describe this in JSON as we did within this example. And we connected it live, and we connected it at different refresh rates. So the top could be 10 hertz, and the fixture and robot uh, process change could just be on change. And we've actually done a piece of work internally at the moment looking at factory plus and spark plug, which again is another piece of work we're doing with the connectivity standards. Um, so reach out. I've got a couple of slides in here that will be sent around the slide pack um, just for information if you're, if you're not aware of what we're doing in that space. And we've connected that to this virtual representation. And then we've actually got this dashboard or immersive environment around how we want to visualize this information. And for those sort of keen eyed amongst you, um, it looks very similar to a diagram I showed before. And, and that's really the point of you can have very simple implementations and still have a digital twin. Um, and in this case, it's actually a supervisory digital twin. So already you've you've got a lot of the infrastructure in place to start understanding and understand the value and, and the culture change and all of the other things around what does digital twin mean to our business. So just briefly then on factory plus then so. Within Catapult Investment this year, we've looked at our adoption of the spark plug uh, specification by Eclipse. And this is sort of going to be our way forward now of standardizing and simplifying the way that shop floor equipment is sort of, or data from it is extracted, transported, um, captured for historical purposes, um, and whatever else. So there is going to be a report released shortly around this, and it's, it's basically how should you adopt spark plug if you wanted to as a business. It's actually built on top of the MQTT architecture rather than OPC UA. And, and, and even more importantly, it's developed by the founders of MQTT. So they've utilized the protocol as well as this architecture on place. And it's actually as well now for those who sort have of gone down the ignition kind of um, integration platforms, as well as quite a few others, they are supporting this as an out of the box functionality now as well. So briefly, it's a way of saying, well, I no longer need to connect PLCs to an ERP to an MES system. It's you go through this unified space. And that's really the crux of it is once we've got this data and we've connected it on this unified system, yes, we've got this sort of supervisory model. Um, so if we hide the prediction in the interactive, that's what we're starting with. But then what that sort of spark plug and sort of what we call internally as factory plus is we can just build on these discrete event simulations or we could build on another simulation on top of it and we have access to that data now so then the diagram just becomes well, we now have a predictive digital twin and for us it was sort of predictive completion time but it could quite have easily been part quality or something else that we actually care about as a business so here just so more of, to round it off really is we've met the six requirements um to look at just how this met a digital twin um, it was slightly fictitious in the part of this project was aimed to implement a digital twin um, and then we have met the requirements but really what I want to get to just sort of working off is how should you approach digital twins and it is for at least from our point it's an approach of we often have clients come to us and say we want a digital twin I'm like great what's your problem um, and, and we always have to do that piece of work with them to start with to go what's the use case what are you driving for does having live connected data or something physical map to something virtual actually solve the problem or do you need to look at other technologies such as digital thread digital passport perhaps even just adopting a plm system to start with to actually address the fundamental problem and the opportunities up there and then once we have reached that place is okay well who should we work with internally as that hence the categorizations earlier for the stakeholders internal customers Planning the design and architecture, as well as sort of the poll that we'd asked last time around sort of trust, security, how do we validate the models for a lot of the um, sort of prediction tools, as well as then saying, well, once we have this architecture in place, you can think long term and you can sort of pin off new systems and new simulations to 
sort of extract the value. Um, one sort of client even worked with us and said, well, yes, we connected that data. And then straight away, four of the stakeholders said, oh, wouldn't it be great if you have this data? It's like, we do. It's here. Go connect to it. Go do what you need with it. Um, so you'll find even when you try and think long term, all the business units internally will suddenly start to realize the, the value in, in having that information connected and available. So that concludes this webinar of the point of the content slides. Um, but really, we just wanted to open it up for questions, really. And uh, any, anything that you'd like me to go back over or, or where next, I guess. Thank you much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, really informative, as usual, from you. And uh, it was really good to finish up on some uh, on some use cases as well, case studies, because that's, that's one thing a lot of people uh, always ask for. Um, we have had some uh, some questions in. I can just find them here now. And one of them is is someone's mentioned. It, so, what about closing the loop, controlling the physical asset from the prediction from the predictions of the digital twin? Yeah, it, it's a good question, and it's what we will do within the um, this diagram at the start here. So, this is in essence closing the loop. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we are facing with some implementations is looking at how we enable the interaction back because of the security concern. There's a lot of clients coming to and said, oh yeah, read only is fine. Like you can have access to the information you want and as long as you're just using it to inform something, that's okay. But the moment that you start saying, well, I want to control a robot halfway around the world utilizing 5G technology because I need low latency, and I want to be able to do it securely, we're going, well, actually, there's quite a lot of work there to prove out the technology to do it. So, yes, it's possible. And yes, the Spark plug specification actually enables bi-directionality of information. Um, and there's work being done internally, um, but it's not something that we are seeing um, a lot of within the manufacturing space. There are other examples of um, IT infrastructure um, around um, the one that comes to mind is the Oculus Quest. Um, so the new immersive VR headset um, is they have a Oculus for Business platform where they could monitor remotely all of the sort of fleet of Oculus devices around the business. And you can actually push um, firmware updates or check on its battery status or kind of understand who's using it or who last to use it or request that uh, certain process happens to it overnight. So yes, they are being done, um, but within sort of the strict confines of what people are being comfortable with. I tell you, we've got a, we've got one more question here, Jonathan. And it sounds like someone actually and um, knows about their twins here. Um, it's interesting your thoughts on whether Spark Plug might be appropriate for intertwin communications for federated digital twins. Yeah, and that's exactly the point of looking at how we have a unified architecture to twins to talk to each other. Um, and the key word there is twins, not twin. Um, so there's a lot of discussion uh, looking at what's called a Russian doll effect around how we have levels of information. So here we have a process and the C-suite might just care around, uh, is it running or not? Is my shop floor doing okay as a traffic light system? And then the, the shop floor supervisor might need a little bit more information of, well, yes, it's been maintained by so much today, uh, so-and-so today. And then um, the person, the engineer who needs to maintain that cell is kind of they have all of the detail that they need available so you've kind of got that sort of pyramid structure around the the, the depth needed um, but then as you need to communicate to other twins is it's more of that the hierarchy almost goes um, a lot of i think research is still being done around well is the isa 95 diagram still valid for a lot of this stuff when plcs need to talk to or digital twins need to have access to plcs mes erp right across the, the previous pyramid sort of diagram this actually breaks down a little bit and understanding how we just enable that to talk to each other is, is yes, the reason for a lot of the, um, um, here we go, a lot of this sort of being just put in place is you have this unified architecture and, and standard namespace and everything can communicate to it along with then of course missions and the security model and everything else behind it. And just the last question here, John. Um, we might probably might have touched on this a bit as you're going through, but what about digital twins for, of populations or business processes as well? How do we actually look to instantiate those? Yeah, another good question. Um, a lot of the business processes actually fall under the enterprise model um, and looking at how we capture um, the right information while the process is being done to inform new processes happening. 
Um, I think I've understood your, correct, uh, your question correctly, at least. Um, but yeah, understanding how we do a lot of these processes and also critically what version of the process they are running when that information was being gathered um, is, is another key research area. And a lot of it gets start to get underpinned with sort of PLM and MES systems. Um, so working with sort of PTC, Siemens, DASO systems, a lot of those to understand how can we have a lot of these workflows implemented to give us the information that we need to then start enabling digital twins. Well, John, thank you very much. There's a, didn't didn't catch you out with those questions, so that's that's a really great step. Um, just 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 to finish up as well, Kevin's asked wondering sort of what's next in this space for the AMRC. So just to let you know, we've got we've got initiation go, um, initiative going on called Factory Plus, which is uh, the AMRC is looking how we enable connectivity through a standardized framework. We're also looking now into digital threads, which is really how we start looking to manage that that single source of truth. So as John mentioned, uh, MES and PLM there, how do we actually you know, ensure that that data, the data that's created at the, right at the, at the initial stage at engineering bomb is carried all the way through and you know you have that closed loop of results of the speeding back, which again fits in nicely with, with what we're talking about, but digital twin and closing the loop. Um, digital passports or ledgers as well, tracking who made what, when, how. That uh, fits in. We talked about engineering bomb. Um, we also look about you know the, the ads built bomb at the end. What is it that who who made it? What went on with it? Where were the concessions and how is it recorded? So it's not just and how is that sort of looking into the blockchain kind of technologies around that? And then finishing up then with sort of manufacturing innovation hubs, so the technology test beds that uh, that allow you to sort of operate within an industrial risk-free environment. So they're they're the, the four main I think big digital initiatives that are going on at the AMRC. And if you'd like to know more, then please, you know, just uh, drop myself or, or or Jonathan here. You've got his details there. Um, a, a quick note, and um, we can we can signpost you into the right direction of the, uh, um, of who you need to speak to. So just to close out on this, everybody, I'm finishing a bit before the hour, but uh, thank you all for your time today. It's uh, it's obviously been very precious, um, especially uh, with the weather being so nice as well. That you've, uh, well, maybe you're outside uh, looking at this, and if you are, well done to you. Um, and uh, now you can return uh, back to uh, if it's uh, firefighting on the shop floor. Um, but please, you know, get in touch with us, whether it's myself, um, you know, I'm Jonathan Bray, Deputy Head of Digital. You can get hold of me on j.bray at amrc.co.uk or Jonathan A there, and whose details are up on the screen. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John.